Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I want to talk about, it's still Gay Pride Month, which is kind of funny because a friend of mine actually pointed this out to me the other day that it's kind of odd that Gay Pride is a month long. I mean, Christmas is one day, Easter's one day, New Year's is one day, you know, um, it, Thanksgiving, it's just bizarre. Mar even Martin Luther King Jr. Day is one day. And so it's very bizarre that gay pride is an, an entire month. Um, I think I've given you a little history on gay pride. I want to, but before I get into that, I want to talk about the supernatural realm, the, the unseen realm. And I'll get into why. But um, first, I want to read Paul. I just want to remind you of Paul's uh, discussion about the unseen realm, the supernatural, the demonic in Ephesians chapter six, he says, Paul says uh, in verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So, that's pretty complex and it's it's pretty powerful that we want we we are not it's not just the seen world that we're dealing with like the politics and gay pride and the flags everywhere i live in you know obviously i'm in los angeles and this is where i live and there's literally gay pride flags on every single building in the entire city it's like in, it's it's so extreme that it's bizarre and I and that's why I want to tie it into the supernatural realm the unseen realm which by the way is a book that I'm reading right now it's called the unseen realm and it's by Dr. Michael Heiser and he's a Semitic and Hebrew scholar ancient Hebrew and Semitic scholar and he's brilliant and I highly recommend this book it's called the unseen realm let me get you the full title oh gosh uh rediscovering the supernatural worldview of the Bible. And this book, The Unseen Realm, is an academic book. So it's pretty long. It's kind of, it's like 432 pages. But he did a second book, more of, more of a popular book, where he distilled down all of these ideas into a, a smaller book called Supernatural, what the Bible teaches about the unseen world and why it matters. And that book is only 170 pages around that. So I recommend either book to you. If you want to do an academic book, read The Unseen Realm. If you want to do more of a popular book, read Supernatural by Dr. Michael Heiser. I'll put the links down below of both books. But I'm reading The Unseen Realm and it is mind blowing. It's so good. And basically, he, Michael Heiser, in the first chapter of the book talks about, he says, he makes this claim that after you read this book, you will never read the Bible in the same way. And it's true because he connects the dots of the Old Testament and the New Testament in such a, an amazing way that it really opens up the world of, of antiquity and the world of scripture. And and the context within which the the uh, Old Testament was written, and kind of the Mesopotamia context, and and where just all of that that region, the the ancient Near East, which is what we would call basically the Middle East today. And so he's an expert in the ancient Near East and antiquity, and so this book is amazing, and it really when I. I'm kind of in the middle of it right now. I'm probably like a third way, a third of the way through or maybe halfway, but it really sparked this kind of thing in me of how gay pride and what's going on in culture today, the whole LGBTQ movement is so tied to the supernatural it's so tied to the unseen realm that we don't even, we're not even aware of. And so we're going to get into that today. And, um, I first want to remind you that 
you know, I, I've posted a couple of articles that I wrote about gay pride and my experience with gay pride parades, gay pride marches or whatever they're called. And I, as I just want to do a quick summary of, of my experience with gay pride. I, I started going to gay pride parades when I was 16 years old in Dallas, Texas. And, and when I first went, I just felt this kind of like, wow, these are my people. I felt fully accepted because I, because I, I was just discovering really that I was basically gay or attracted to at least attracted to the same sex. But at the, in the eighties, this was all in the eighties. And so in the eighties, uh, homosexual behavior was starting to move from a behavior to an identity. That's when, I mean, it started in the seventies. Um, the, the, as, as I've talked about before the Stonewall in, which is a gay bar in the West village in New York, which I've been to several times, uh, in 1969, there the, the Stonewall Inn was it's a it was basically a men's gay bar in New York City, and it was raided by police in the early hours on I forgot the date June twenty uh, June twenty eighth 19, 1969. and that sparked all these riots kind of the, for in the following days and. And that's why in the following year of June, June 1970 is when the gay pride kind of marches started. And, and at first they were very political. Uh, now they're kind of more, poli they're political and sort of entertainment at the same time. But in the beginning they were all very much political. And uh, that, so that's why, just so you know, that's why June is gay pride month because that's when the Stonewall Inn in New York was, uh, that's when the, the, the riot started in, in New York. So, so gay, so when I was 16, I went to gay pride and I just remember feeling this like elation and just kind of camaraderie with, with people. And I was like, wow, like this is, and so I was living like this weird double life because in, in high school I was, you know, I was like, popular and had lots of friends and like had girlfriends. I went steady with, I think three, at least three girls. I went, I had serious girlfriends in high school and, um, but I, at the same time I was like sneaking off to gay bars and I was sneaking off to gay pride and, and you know, no one really knew it, it was just kind of this, this dark secret I had. And, and so I, it's weird because when I first started, and I talk about this in this, the articles I've written, but when I first started experimenting with, with sexuality, really, every time, I, every time something happened, I would feel this, this shame. I would feel this guilt and the shame. And it was weird. It, would, it just would last several days, sometimes a week. But the more and more I engaged in that sort of re reality, the more I engaged in that sexuality, the, you know, my heart just kept getting harder and harder. And like, it's kind of just Romans one all over again. It's, it's like, again, Paul uses homosexual behavior as the illustration in Romans one of human beings suppressing the truth. So I was actively suppressing the truth. Uh, even though I wasn't fully aware of it, but at the time I was aware that, that the stuff I was doing was, was, was shameful. It was weird. I knew something was off. I knew it was kind of, I knew it was wrong sort of, but I, I just was like, but this is, this is how I feel. So I don't know how to, I don't know how to reconcile these two things. The fact that I know sort of the shame and the guilt and I sort of know the truth about this, but I'm also going to pursue it anyway. So it was weird that I, but of course, you know, as I said, the more and more I engaged in that stuff, the, the, the less and less guilt and shame happened after, 
after each time. And so by the time I was in my, you know, early twenties, when I met my first boyfriend, the, you know, all kind of vestiges sort of, not all, there was still a tiny vestige, but most vestiges of that kind of that, understanding that something is off like even in when i lived in la in my early 20s and went to pride parades here i kind of was like something's weird about this like this is off like there, there's there's too much decadence there's too much celebration of decadence and there's you know there's gay men that are super buff on these crazy floats, you know, and they're, they're wearing tiny little speedo bathing suits and they're dancing on these floats. And I just remember just thinking like, this is, this is bizarre. Like this is a bizarre world. And I kind of, I kind of didn't want to be in it, but I knew I really had no alternative. I was like, well, this is kind of the way I feel and this is the world I guess I'm in. And so, I embraced a, a lot, a lot of it, but I rejected some parts of it, like the weird, <laughs> the weird naked dancing on floats, and and the and the pride parades were just so. Um, as I said, they were decadent, but they were also just so, almost disturbing in a way. There were there were parts of the parades that were very very disturbing. There were like, like demonic elements to it that even as when I was living that life, I just was like, this is creepy. It was almost like a Halloween thing. <laughs> and so anyway, and I, you know, I obviously lived that life as a gay man until 2009 when God rescued me out of that life and saved me. And it was such an amazing thing. I'm so, I'm still just so excited that God rescued me out of that because it's it is as much as it, it's painted as you know this like joyful celebration and the rainbows are everywhere it's actually a really dark thing it's really dark and um so in the article I say that gay pride promises much it promises liberation instead of constraint affirmation instead of condemnation authenticity instead of hiding, acceptance instead of rejection, strength instead of weakness. But it's a make-believe world. It's, it's not real. And it's a make-believe world where one can glory in, in one's sin and without consequences. Um, obviously, there, there were a lot of consequences in the 80s with, with AIDS which affected a lot of my friends. Um, and so, and some of my friends have died from AIDS, uh, from that, from that time. And, but the gospel in contrast to gay pride, uh, delivers, the gospel delivers, it delivers freedom from shame instead of endless cycles of guilt, fear, and regret. And of course it offers life. It offers us life instead of death. So there's, there's, it's, it's just such a stark contrast between gay pride and the gospel. The gay pride leads to death. The gospel leads to life. I know that's a strong statement. I know it's probably shocking to some of you, but that's the truth. It, it's true. And uh, yeah, so I, again, I thought I was super sexually liberated for all those years, um, but I didn't realize I was in sexual, I was in bondage. I was in chains. I was literally, not literally, I was figuratively in chains. And um, it's just, an, it's just amazing how, how, what great, to, to what lengths people will go to rationalize sin. And that's why uh, that's partly why there's such a crazy push, uh, especially this year. This year seems different from the past. This seems, gay pride seems like it's it's been ratcheted up so much more. It seems so extreme this year. It's bizarre. I mean, I've never seen like all the corporations who are putting flags on, you know, pride flags on their logos and all that stuff. It's really it's, it's bizarre. It's, it's, it's an upside down world. It's bizarro world. 
And even as a, you know, if I were still living as a gay man, I would just be kind of like, this is too much. Like, this is too extreme. Like, calm down, people. <laughs> because, yeah, because back in the 80s, it wasn't in the 90s, too. It wasn't as 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 uh, kind of frenetic and as extreme. So it's really gotten pretty nuts. Um and I just, you know, I just want to quote Paul because um, he says in his, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, and this is what happened to me when God saved me. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So the gospel is good news indeed. And so anyway, I want to get into... Dr. Michael Heiser's book. I mean, I should just, I should finish it before I, start, I talk about it, but I'm so excited about it. I have to talk about, a little bit about it. Um, maybe I'll do some more on it later, but so he, and I want to tie this into, to gay pride. So he says that, you know, one of his state claims is, or one of his statements is that you know, most Christians, if you ask them what, why is the world the way it is? Why is it so crazy and, and destructive and, you know, all around us? It's, it just, it's so decadent. It's decaying. Why is that? And most Christians would just answer with the answer because of the fall, because of the fall of mankind in Genesis 3. But he says that's actually not the full answer. The full answer is that there are three rebellions in Genesis that we kind of, we don't really, we kind of overlook. And so the first rebellion is the fall in Genesis 3. And the second rebellion is in Genesis chapter 6, which I will read just the first part of it, the first four verses, if I can find it. I should just use my Bible, but I'm using these papers. <laughs> so in Genesis chapter 6, he's talking about the increasing corruption on the earth. And it says, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God... Now, that's important to remember. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. And in verse four, he says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old and the men of renown or the men of the name. So this little section of Genesis is sound. It's kind of bizarre. It's like, who are the Nephilim? Who are the sons of God? Like what's going on? Why are, why are these sons of God going into these attractive women on the earth. And so Dr. Michael Heiser would, he talks about this passage and this is the second major kind of, uh, moment in, in the biblical history and, and the narrative where, where the corruption starts to get ratcheted up. It becomes more, it, it increases. So Michael uh, Heiser says that the sons of God, which some some scholars think are human beings. I don't believe that anymore. Um, I think the sons of God are supernatural beings. They are cosmic intelligences who who did things that acceler that that resulted in the the proliferation and acceleration of our own human depravity and destruction. And they they hurtled us toward idolatry, these sons of God. And so th again, this is supernatural. This is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians six, the supernatural, the supernatural realm. And, and so he says in, uh, in Genesis six, he says that, um, 
that it says that they, the supernatural beings, these cosmic intelligences took wives, human beings, they took human being wives and they basically impregnated them. And the result was the Nephilim. Uh, so the, the, and the Nephilim are these kind of giants, these, these giant creatures. And, and it sounds so kind of bizarre and sounds too supernatural, uh, even though the Bible is, is, is a, a book about, you know, there's a lot of supernatural events in the Bible, including a donkey speaking, including the serpent speaking in the garden, including the resurrection, the virgin birth, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so it's not surprising that there's supernatural things happening and there's, there's this unseen realm as, as the book is called. And, and so God pronounces judgment. He says, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Now, some Bible scholars think that that's God putting a, a limit on humans lifespan. I don't think that's the case. I think that the 120 years is the time bet between this event and Noah and the flood, basically. So it's, it's 120 years between the Nephilim and Noah, the flood. And so, yeah. And so he says that the, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, which is interesting. So were they still around after the flood? That's an, and I think Michael Heiser, I think he says that they, they were still around after the flood. I mean, look at, if you remember the, in, um, is it Exodus or numbers? when they, the spies go into the land and they see the giants. I can't remember which book it is now, or it could be Deuteronomy. Anyway, in one of those books, this, but they, they do it twice. Spies go into Canaan and they see these giants. Um, anyway, so, so that's the second rebellion, Genesis six. And it, it just increases the, the corruption of, of humans. It increases the depravity of man. So it's not just the fall. So it's the fall, Genesis 6, and then we go to Genesis 11, which is the Tower of Babel story, or Babel, however you want to pronounce it. I think the Hebrew is Babel. So in the Tower of Babel story, remember that the whole, it says, the, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. So everyone spoke the same language. And, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. This is in Babylon. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks. So they basically, they basically kind of invented bricks. And once they realized they could make bricks, they started to have this desire to build this kind of uh, sort of temple mount or this ziggurat, what is what it's called. Uh, this kind of place where they could meet with the gods because they thought that, you know, if the gods were in the air and the higher they built this ziggurat or this kind of sort of pyramid sort of like structure, the higher they built it, they, you know, the closer to the gods they could get and they could uh, bring, even bring the gods down to them. And so, um, so they say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. So again, they're wanting to make a name for themselves instead of, instead of honoring the name of God, uh, Yahweh. Um, so again, this is like uh, ratcheting up more and more rebellion, more and more destruction. And so it says in verse five, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only, only the beginning of what they will do. <laughs> so God's like, let's, let's cut this off. Let's at the knees, let's stop this. Cause this is only the beginning of what they're going to do. These rebellious people that I created, these humans that I created to be in a relationship with, and they're just going, they're going crazy. So let's stop this. And God says, come let us confuse 
And when he says let us, what he's, he's not talking about the Trinity here. He's, the, the reason he uses the plural, let us, is he's talking about the divine council, the, all the, the, the heavenly realm, the heavenly council, uh, the, the, basically the angels, the heavenly host, um, basically God's entourage <laughs> in, in the heavens. And so he says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and et cetera. And be, because, and it's called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth and the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So this is kind of the beginning of, if you want to talk about like critical race theory or kind of racial division, this is kind of where it starts. It's like God scatters people and divides people and uh, confuses their languages. And so this is kind of where that, in my opinion, this is where, I don't even know if Dr. Heiser talks about this, but I, I think this is where this all begins. Uh, this kind of tension between nations, between races, between uh people people groups so so those are the three judgments you know god it's it's uh genesis 3 with the fall it's it's the tower it's uh genesis 6 and it is genesis 11 with the tower of babel and so it really these these kind of spiritual beings ratchet up as i said they ratchet up the depravity of man on earth and then of course god calls out well then there's the flood and and god saves noah and his family um but then there's more rebellion after that and then finally god calls abraham out of abram out of ur and then he's called abraham after that but he calls him out of ur into canaan and God says to Abraham, as you know, he makes a covenant and he says, you know, the, the nations will be blessed uh, by your seed. So, uh, which is, which is amazing that God even de designed that plan. So God abandons the nations until uh, he starts, he brings Abram out of Ur and starts that whole process. So, by the way, Elohim, so that, that term sons of gods that I, I've read, it's the term is Elohim. And we, we of course associate the word Elohim with God, with Yahweh, but Elohim is not, not a title. It's a set of attributes. So yes, God is Elohim, but there are also other Elohim in the spiritual realm, other kind of, uh, different ranks of angels. And, and so an Elohim is basically a disembodied, member of the spiritual world and there's as i said there's different ranks and hierarchies of elohim and yahweh is in this yahweh's in the spiritual realm but so are others so uh, we have to remember that we have to remember that there's a whole spiritual realm going on there's a battle between god and his and his heavenly host and satan and his demonic <laughs> his demonic host so and the question is, oh, an interesting question Michael Heiser brings up is why, if Satan knows what his fate is, if he knows that he's going to be destroyed and these demons know they're going, they, they're not stupid. They know what's going to happen. They know uh, the end of the story, that Jesus is going to crush them. So why are they, why are they trying so desperately to attack Christians or keep, non-believers from from entering the kingdom of god why are they so desperate to hang on and it's because it goes back to romans 11 and it goes back to the full this this biblical concept of the fullness of the gentiles so christ is returning when the fullness of the gen gentiles is is complete and so 
and that's when the nations will be reclaimed through the gospel. That's when the, there will be the fullness of the gospel and all of the nations will be reclaimed. And so they, they're aware of that. These demonic beings these in the demonic realm, they are aware of this, but they are trying to basically just delay. They're delaying their judgment because that's why they're so desperately attacking Christians and non-believers and um, trying to prevent, trying to slow down basically the, their judgment and what's going to happen to them. So that's the reason. And it seems like now in our world, you know, does it, does it not seem like, I mean, it's been going on for, for centuries and centuries and millennia, but, but it seems now that things are really getting, as I keep saying, ratcheted up and, the demonic is really kind of, and this is why, you know, there's drag queen story hour. And this is why Nickelodeon, I just, you know, read that article about Nickelodeon or I saw the video where they have a drag queen, um, teaching kids in some show. I don't know what show it is, but it sounds pretty crazy. And, and by the way, that when, when drag queens, I hate that term is funny, but when drag queens do that kind of stuff, it, because I remember when I was, I think I was 15 or maybe even 14, I went to my first drag show in Dallas at a gay bar. And it was, I just was so shocked. I was blown away by it. I was like, whoa. It just was so stunning to me. And I, in almost in a good way, but also in a scary, I was kind of scared. <laughs> but what's weird about the drag queen thing is it's, it sexualizes. It's very sexual. Um, it sexualizes the, the children who are seeing this it, because they're seeing this bizarre image of sexuality. So it, it sexualizes them at a very young age, which is crazy. And I, so, so we obviously we're living in this time now where it feels like an upside down world and it feels like the end is nigh, <laughs> the end is close. But, uh, and, and I just want to just remind us that, and Dr. Heiser is just amazing at doing this in his book that, yeah, there are some major spiritual forces at work major demonic forces. And so it's almost like, it's funny because when I, as I'm reading his book, it's, I am now less sort of perturbed is, I don't know if that's the right word really, but, um, perturbed at, at people in politics or people in, in, um, in media or, or celebrities who are promoting, all of this stuff who are promoting ba basically wickedness. I'm less perturbed by, by them specifically because I now understand that there is demonic activity and demo a whole unseen realm behind them that they're, they, they're not even aware of it. And this demonic realm is in a way you kind of using them as puppets for their, for their purposes. And they're not even aware of that. So, so now when I pray, I pray more against the demonic realm, uh, more so than, you know, for these specific people in, in, in positions of power and influence. And so I, I've really kind of shifted my prayer life into seeing, and so I, I have more, I have way more sympathy now for, you know, certain wicked so-called you know certain seemingly very wicked people in the world i have more sympathy for them because of because of this book that i'm reading and because there is such a, a demonic realm that is pulling a lot of the strings because i remember in genesis 6 it's like these sons of god these these principalities and powers of of the air saw the daughters of man and saw that they were attractive and they went, they took them as wives and went into them. So these women really had no choice in the matter. They were, 
they were uh, basically raped. <laughs> they were. They were raped by the superna these supernatural beings. And so, um, so now I have a different kind of understanding of, kind of, well, not a different, but I have a more enhanced understanding of the supernatural and of the the prince of the power of the air, as Paul talks about, and the the the, the principalities and and all whatever I read in Ephesians six, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So I have a better understanding of that now. And I'm, and I hope this helps you kind of see all that's going around us, that's happening around us with, you know, the, with gay pride, with the LGBTQ movement, with the trans movement, with um, all kinds of things that are happening, Marxism and um, CRT, like all this stuff is being fueled by the demonic realm, if not even, um, I mean, humans, we have free will, but it's also, it's, it's not only fueled, but it, in some cases it's directly being controlled by the demonic realm, which is scary, <laughs> but praise God as believers, um, Satan has no authority over us because we are, we are no longer slaves to Satan, but we are bond servants to Christ. We're no longer slaves to darkness, but we are in the light, which is praise God for that. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine still being in the dark. Um, and so, and by the way, if there's anyone watching who's not in the light, who doesn't, hasn't put his or her faith in Christ, I beg you to do so because you're, you're not aware of that you are serving Satan right now, that you are serving, that you're in the kingdom of darkness right now. And, and I beg you to, uh, just, just beg God to have mercy on you and to, to bring you into his marvelous light because there's nothing like it. It is so amazing and supernatural. And, um, and of course you, you get eternal life when you do that, when you put your trust in Christ, not only does he forgive all of your sins, but he imputes his righteousness to you. And so you're covered in perfect righteousness and you have eternal life. And because you're imputed with his righteous, with Christ's righteousness, because of the sacrifice he did on the cross, um, you can stand in the day of judgment. You are declared innocent and you can stand in the presence of the holiness of God and be innocent and blameless because of what Christ did. So, uh, because when you get, when, when that moment happens, when you put your trust in Christ and believe in him as your Lord and savior, you're united to Christ. Christ is in you and you're in Christ. So there's this union that that's gets, by the way, that rarely gets talked about too, that we're united to Christ and we're co-heirs with Christ. We're heirs to God and co-heirs with Christ, which is amazing. So, I urge you, if you're not a believer, put your trust in Christ. Read the Gospels. Go to a, a gospel church, a gospel center church, and hear the preaching of the word. Put your trust in Christ. And I hope this helped you. And um, I will see you next week on the Becca Cook Show. God bless you guys. And I'll talk to you then. Bye.